Praise the Lord, everybody. In case you didn't know, it's 7 o'clock, and it is time to worship the Lord. <laughs> Together. If you're not, would you stand with us and just sing with us tonight? Worship the Lord with us. Also got a kidney disease, so 
to remember my mom. She did have the, that biopsy I was telling you guys about. And she should be finding out those results probably by Friday or maybe Monday, um, she said. So just continue to remember her. She did say that um, the biopsy was pretty painful when it was happening. So just pray for her that she would not be still experiencing any kind of pain from that. All right. And she said, I watched church um, and I seen that you guys prayed for me and it really uh, lifted me up. It really helped me. So I was thankful for her to know that, you know, she was watching and she knows that we're praying for her. We have lots of needs on the screen. Um, we need to remember Tony Nelson is in St. Francis Hospital due to cancer complications. And Sister Sally's 11 month old grandson had a recent surgery. He did get to come home. We're giving God the glory for that. Amen. And um, we still have, we need to still remember Sarah and Gary, Beulah, Anthony, Melissa, Darla, the yes. prodigals, our community, and an outpouring of the Holy Ghost needs to go on. And that's always going to need to be happening for somebody. Um, I love this church, and I just want to say that it's encouraging coming to this place and see new faces here and there. Yes. Might not have 20 new people on a Sunday, but it seems like always we see a new face in the crowd and God's really working yes, in and around our community. And I'm thankful just to be a part of it. And I know that you are too. Let's go ahead and take these needs before him right now. Lord, thank we worship you, God. you, God. We thank you for this chance just to be in your presence, God. We thank you that we can come into this place, Lord, and that we can come before you and, and bow down at your feet, God. We can give all of our requests to you, all of our needs, everything that weighs on our hearts tonight, God. We can give it to you, Lord. We pray that you would just move and touch those people tonight who need your healing. God, just move on their bodies, Lord. Touch them. Let them know that you're near to them, God. Pray that you would just touch the addicted, God. Those people who are bound with chains, God, that they can't get free from without you, Lord. We pray for them tonight that you would just strengthen them, God. Help them to look up to see your face, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now for every person that's personally dealing with something in their own body, in their own mind, in their own spirit that's in this room tonight, God. I pray that you would move and let your spirit flow in this place tonight in a way that when they leave here, God, they know that they're not alone, that they have been touched by your spirit, God. In the name of Jesus, I praise you and I thank you, God, for what you have done in every life, God. And I praise you and I thank you for the, 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 just the, the good things. God, the reports that we've heard this week, God, the things that you have already moved in, Lord, I know that you are moving and working in everything. We will give you glory for in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Found in your hands, fullness of joy, everything, suddenly why.
Thank you, God. Thank you. Hallelujah. The God that we serve, there is only one like him. Hallelujah. Oh, God, like us. He is truly a matchless God. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. His presence is strong in this room. And I think this is a good time for us to continue on into the word. And we're going to go ahead and dismiss into our classes right now. I pray that you would be blessed and learn something from the word tonight. Oh, yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, glorious, glorious Jesus. Thank you. Opportunity to be in the presence of the Lord oh, yes. with each of you. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. Thank yes. you for taking part in the worship service. I appreciate so much our young people who are such a big part of uh, everything that goes on here in the church. And uh, thankful for each of you, amen, that make the church what it is. And uh, we want to not just be a good church but be a great church yeah. amen? amen amen all right well, we're gonna get right into the word of the lord tonight uh, this is the fourth lesson in a series i see that we have about 40 minutes here um, before i have to be done and i think i will get done tonight good lord willing and i'm going to read to you from romans chapter 5 verse 8 as we finish up this series hopefully tonight on uh, the idea of making room for the Holy Ghost. And I think we're getting the message. And I think for the most part, uh, we understand these things and we need to be reminded from time to time. But this is certainly a group of people that is no, uh, that is, uh, are not strangers to the moving of the Spirit. And that is what our world needs. We don't need a dead, dry church. We don't need formalism. Right. We need a move of God in our generation. And um, it takes people who are dedicated to that because you know what? The enemy is, is working against a move of the Spirit. Right. That's one thing that he can't handle. He's got us figured out. And I think he has God figured out, but there's just nothing he can do about the power of God. 
but he knows how the Spirit of God moves, and he knows what to do to hinder. Uh, he knows what to do um, to sidetrack us if we will allow him to. And so we've been talking about the things that we must do in order to make sure that in all of our services and in our daily lives there is room for the Holy Ghost to move. I want you to read these two scriptures with me out loud, if you would. Romans 5 and 8 and 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. They're short scriptures, but they're very powerful. Romans 5 and 8 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. So in other words, whatever you focus on, that is what you're going to get. Uh, one scripture says, that if we sow to the flesh, of the flesh we will reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, then we're going to reap life everlasting. So it all has to do with where your focus is and what your goal is. Unfortunately, when we come to church, not everybody always comes um, for the same purpose or the same goal. We don't always have that, um, that spirit of, of, as Acts chapter 2 recorded, when they were in one place and in one accord, uh, when they were in unity as far as their goal, then the Spirit began to move and be poured out upon them. And so we have to be mindful that we attend to the things of the Spirit if we want the Spirit to move. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands if I had a dollar for every message and every Bible lesson that I have heard in my lifetime in the church and I grew up in the church I don't remember my first church service I don't remember the first time I felt God I've, I've just always been here um, and then I started preaching Whenever I was 16 years old, I turned 50 next month, and I've already been preaching 34 years. I feel like an old man, and maybe 50 is getting old. I don't know, but I guess everybody that's over 50 would say, no, you're, you're doing good. But I've heard a lot of messages and a lot of Bible studies on this subject, Brother Steve, the key to revival. You know, boy, I've heard a lot of, a lot of messages on that. And uh, I was surprised to find out that uh, there was a bunch of different keys. It always preached the key to revival, but it was, but nobody ever agreed on what the key was. Well, Paul told Timothy, his son in the gospel, he said, you already have what you need. Right. He said, the gift of God is already in you, but you've got to stir it up. You've got to stir it up. So I think that we're not, we don't need to be necessarily looking for yet another uh, missing piece of the puzzle but we need to use what we have and God has placed within us everything we need the word of God says that God has given to every man the measure of faith right. uh, God has filled us with his spirit so we have what we need if we'll just activate it remember the uh, the woman in the Old Testament whose um, husband had died and her two sons were being uh, sold into, I guess, indentured uh, servanthood to pay off their bills uh, because they were not able to pay the bills. And so she began to ask the prophet um, for help. And he said, well, what do you have in the house? Right. And she said, I don't have anything except a pot of oil. And he said, that's all you need. He said, you go get that oil and you go out and borrow as many vessels as you can and begin to pour the oil. And when the oil is flowing, when the oil is moving, you're going to find that you're going to have everything that you need to take care of your problem. And that's what I'm trying to say to you tonight. We already have what we need. What we have is already in the house. Amen. It's the oil of God's presence, his anointing, his spirit. And we just have to make room for him to move in our midst. Making room for the Holy Ghost was a big part of the Apostle Paul's teaching and throughout his epistles the concept of walking in the Spirit, being led of the Spirit, and following after the Spirit, that is a central theme. You can pick that up in pretty much any book that he's writing. You can pick up that theme 
Walk in the Spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. On and on and on. It talks about the flesh warring against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And that they who are led of the Spirit are not under the law. He, he tells of great power and victory we have, but it all comes through the work of the Spirit. Yes, and in his first letter to the church of Thessalonica, we've been studying this. Uh, this is our fourth week on it, uh, where he gave them a concise list of instructions to follow uh, to make sure that their walk with God remained a true spiritual walk and not just a form of or tradition and these instructions you see them on the screen here they're very concise easy to follow along uh, with and to implement if we'll just be obedient uh, to the word of God and what pastor has been teaching but we'll find if we will do these things then we will have a real relationship with God which is much more uh, effective uh, a much more effective way to live for God than the alternative of reliance on the force of tradition and ritual, which in actuality very often obstructs the move of the Spirit instead of making room for it. Okay? So if we come in and we say, well, church has got to be exactly 45 minutes long or an hour long or an hour and 15 minutes long or an hour and a half, whatever we decide that it has to be, uh, if, we, if we put God in that box... Okay, Or if we say God has to move according to a certain style of music that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. Okay, So a lot of times people try to make God in their image right. when God's intent was he made us in his image and he wants us to be conformed to his image, not the other way around. But right. tradition and ritual, what does it do? It tends to put God in a box and within strict confines of how that we want things to be. And the Spirit doesn't work within our confines. I don't get worried. That doesn't mean we're going to uh, have church for three hours tonight. But my point is, is that we can't um, make things quite that rigid and expect to have a move of the Spirit. Um, i got to be very careful here. I will stretch this into another, another week, Brother Scott. Um, but I was thinking, was it Sunday? I'm trying to think. Uh, somebody said to me after church, um, you know, everything was going along, but then you added in a song that wasn't in the schedule. So nobody knew what you was doing. You know, they weren't being critical. They were just saying that, you know, we didn't see that one coming. Well, that's because I didn't see that coming. But when we got to a certain place in the service, it just kind of felt like right. we need to pause right here. We need yes, to sir. we need to have a sila moment. We need to reflect. Hallelujah. We need to let the spirit right. move here. Right. And uh, when we do that, then God steps into those moments. And I've said many, many times that in every service, I believe there's a moment when heaven kisses earth. Right. But sometimes we don't have the wherewithal to pucker up, right? We don't have the wherewithal to come together with the Spirit and allow God to touch us and move in our lives. All right, so you see here, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. So there's seven uh, specific areas here that Paul addresses and he's letting us know that if we will do these things then we will make room for the spirit to continue his work in us in the yes, first sir. three lessons of the series we covered verses 16 through 19 uh, talking about the importance of rejoicing being consistent in prayer giving thanks to God in every circumstance and not quenching the spirit when we begin to experience a move of God. A lot of times, God's spirit begins to move, but uh, our flesh will attempt to shut down out of fear or right. out of stubbornness or whatever the, uh, the reason is. Many times our flesh will uh, quench the spirit when he begins to 
uh, do the work in our life that is intended by God. And so uh, we must be careful not to do that. We talked about this in the last lesson. And now we come to the fifth instruction that the Apostle Paul gave us to ensure that there's always room for the continuing work of God's Spirit in our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 20, despise not prophesying. And that's not near as mystical and deep as it sounds. Despise not prophesying. You know, the gift of prophecy, as I said, is really not quite as mystical as, as we might think. Uh, we think of prophecy always as perhaps uh, what happened in our service here on Sunday when Brother Pulliam spoke that powerful, uh, edifying word. Uh, that's the spirit of prophecy. That's, and it's a gift that is supernatural that moves in the congregation uh, according to God's will as he imparts that word, as he gives that word. But what most people do not realize is that um, Prophecy, the gift of prophecy is active a lot more than what we think because it's not always quite as sensational. Sometimes it, it comes in the form of teaching. It comes in the form of preaching. You know, Brother Steve, whenever you're preaching and in that moment that you just kind of get off your notes for a little bit and you say something that you wasn't planning on saying and then you, you stop in that moment and you think, man, that was really good. That was probably the spirit of prophecy right. interjecting into the message. And yes, we must prepare, we must, uh, and, and the word's anointed, but there is both a written word, a spoken word, and there is the rema word, which is a now word. So there's a word of God that's forever settled in heaven, but there's also a pertinent word for this moment, right? right. Do you believe that? There's a pertinent right. word for what you're going through right now. And if your approach is, you know, the, like the, the, the guy that opens his Bible and, and says, Lord, whatever you want for me today, and just kind of sticks his finger there, and that never worked for me. That never worked for me. But under the anointing, I mean, there's no telling what scripture you're going to land on when you do that, right? But whenever you're under the anointing and uh, the Spirit of God is moving, that Rima word often comes in that moment, and it comes very often while the word of God is being preached. And you say, well, I thought prophecy was foretelling, telling something that's going to happen in the future. Well, that is uh, the major part of prophecy that we think of, but there's actually two parts to prophecy, and that is foretelling, telling of future events, and also foretelling or retelling past events, okay? At a, at a pertinent time. So that fits into the spirit of prophecy. The word of God, I quote this all the time, or mention this all the time, that the things that happened in the Old Testament, those stories that we read, Paul said those things happened to serve as examples for you and I. So when we begin to retell those things, we talk about Daniel in the lion's den, and, and we talk about Paul on the ship in the middle of the storm, and we tell all these stories, David slaying Goliath. What does it do? It inspires faith Amen. in us to believe God for whatever giant we are facing or whatever mountain or whatever storm that we are dealing with. And that is the power of the Word of God as it's being sp spoken into our lives. Unfortunately, uh, the Word of God uh, is not always a word that we want to hear. Okay? Our flesh doesn't always want the Word. Uh, but if we do not apply the word that is preached to our own life, um, then what we are doing is despising prophesying. So right. Paul says, don't despise prophesying. Don't despise when someone stands up and says, thus saith the word of the Lord, and gives us a powerful direction or instruction. He said, if you want the spirit to move in your life, you cannot despise the word of God whenever it's delivered to you, right. whenever something um, comes down your pew, something comes your way that is needed for that moment in your life. So uh, we have to receive the word, and Proverbs 28 and 9, I want Sister uh, 
Rebecca to read that for us. It's a very important scripture um, that shows us the importance of not despising uh, God's word. Go ahead and read that for us. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer, is abomination. In other words, God detests the prayer of a person that turns away their ear from his law. Right. Okay. In the Old Testament, I don't remember how many times that a person would experience this in their lifetime, uh, and so I'm not going to say it definitively, but I know that every so many years they were required for the whole congregation to gather and the priest or the prophet, they would read the books of the law out loud in the hearing of everyone. I don't know how long that took, but they made sure that everybody heard the word once every so often, okay? And they read the entire, um, the entire books of the law in their hearing. And um, I, I don't know exactly how that works, Brother Steve, if you've got millions of people standing out there in a congregation they didn't have sound systems so perhaps they had to read a line and shout it and, and to the next person uh, furthest earshot away and the next crier would probably deliver the same line just imagine that in a huge crowd trying to read all the books of law and he said everybody's going to stand there or sit there and you are going to hear the words of the law and the book of Proverbs says and if a person would turn away their ear from hearing the word of God. In other words, you know what? If I don't hear that, then maybe it don't have to apply to me. Uh, ignorance is bliss. But he said, you have the opportunity. If you turn your ear away from hearing the law, then when you pray, God is going to even detest right. your prayer. That's right. So the Apostle Paul said it. Um, Proverbs says it. Many other passages tell us that we are not to despise the word of God and specifically despise not uh, prophesying. And I think that really applies more to uh, the Rima word or that uh, prophetic voice as it goes forth and trying to touch a specific situation that's ongoing in our lives. Um, I've always believed that if we will just come to church when the doors are open, not even adding anything extracurricular in there. Just be there on Wednesday. Be there on Sunday. Be there when the doors are open. Then most of the problems, if the pastor and the ministry are, are in prayer and are seeking after God, I believe that most of the things that we're dealing with, the Word of God will speak to. Now, that's amazing. Because we may be in this, in this service and us have ten different kinds of situations. But when the word of God goes forth with anointing and in power, God has a way of saying something to that one there and that one there. And the rest of us not even know what God was saying to them. We only received the thing that was, that was meant for us. And... You know, the hardest thing to do probably is, is, especially starting out the church, when you have just a few people gathered, it's hard to preach sometimes the things that uh, God gives you because um, if all the people are very close to you and you know a lot about them, then what are they going to say? Right. They're going to say, well, he just preached that because he knew this, that, or the other. When Brother Dominguez came and preached here, if you all remember, we had nine people receive the Holy Ghost. Many people were healed in that one service. And Brother um, Eugene Dominguez, missionary to Peru, I had never met the man. And uh, so when he came into town uh, to preach the next day, when they drove in, at that time we didn't have the evangelist quarters here, so they, we got them a motel room in Popper Bluff, and we met them at a restaurant in Popper Bluff. And uh, we were sitting there talking, and I started to say something. It wasn't a, anything specific about anybody in the church or anything going on. It was just a generalization, you know. And uh, he stopped me and said, oh, brother, he said, please don't tell me anything about your church. He said, I don't want to know anything about your church. He said, I want the Lord to be able to use me without me uh, worrying that I'm yes, saying something because 
uh, you filled me in on any particular situation, which I was not going to do, but he warned me and said that's not the way that, um, that I want to operate. And he did, he did operate in a great power and anointing. And so, but this is the thing, you know, when the word of God comes to us, we have a choice to say, I, I believe that was the word of God, I receive it. Or to say, I think that that was just uh, what pastor felt to say uh -huh. because he knows about my situation and that's just his way of giving me uh, an earful of his own advice. So Apostle Paul warned us against that. And if we don't have confidence in the man of God um, to receive the word that he preaches, right. and you understand, I'm not a person that that uh, advocates, you know, you follow blindly and you just do whatever the pastor says. But if you don't have confidence that your pastor is hearing from the Lord or that he's operating in the flesh, you need to find a pastor that you can have confidence in. So true. Because you need to be able to receive Amen. the word of God as it is declared to you. Is this all right? Yeah. Yes, sir. So don't turn away your ear from the word of God uh, and make your own prayer an abomination to the Lord. All right, the sixth thing. That Paul said we should do as Christians who are minding the things of the Spirit is to prove all things and to hold on or hold fast to that which is good. So I think what he's saying is don't jump into things. Everything must be proven by the word of God. Sometimes we make decisions in life so easily and so hastily and then we find ourselves in a pickle right. and all we had to do was just stop for a few minutes and consult the Lord. You know, just ask God, Lord, is this your will? Now I have been in some situations where I second guessed it later but I did ask the Lord and I did pray and I did seek his face and God gave me a clear direction and then later on when things went the wrong direction in that situation I at least had peace to know that I don't understand why things have turned out this way but I do know that that for whatever reason God wanted me to go down this path and so all things are going to work together for good in this situation he is going to turn it around some way but if you just go willy-nilly through life and just do whatever your flesh tells you to do in the moment, um, then you're not going to have that peace when you find yourself in difficult uh, situations. And so we could apply this uh, to all kinds of decisions that we make. And we make, we make, you know, probably hundreds of little decisions every month. You know, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes those decisions don't seem to be very important, but we should always uh, ask the Lord for his direction. And I believe the easiest way to do that is just to start out the day with that mindset. Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray, but he said, when you pray, you pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So you begin to pray, and the way you start out is you say, Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. I want your direction today. I want to seek first your kingdom. And if we will do that, then uh, we will be able to get in the right uh, vein, the right direction uh, to do the will of God in every situation. So he said, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Everything must be proven by the word of God. Uh, some people can change uh, doctrines and understandings of the word as frequently as, as someone would change their underclothes. All right. But Ephesians 4 and 14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Yes. Another scripture says, try the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. I have met people that their main problem was that they took in too much different kinds of information yes, and they didn't prove any of it out and they tried to believe everything at the same time. Sometimes you can't believe science 
and at the same time believe the word of God. Okay? Uh, now, I do believe that, that good science will eventually catch up with the word of God. But at the end of the day, it is, it is theory until it is proven. But the word of God is already proven. Hopefully no one's here that's a flat earther. But, but we can argue about it all day long. But long before men discovered that the earth wasn't flat and that you wouldn't sell off the end of it, do you know what the book of Job said? Job said the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. Okay? So uh, it was already there in the word of God. We didn't understand it, right? And um, well, I could give you lots of my opinions tonight, but... Um, I do believe that there's faulty science and I do believe that there's science that um, will catch up with the word of God and will correct itself. Yes, but, but if it contradicts the word of God, then I go with the word of God. Right. Okay. Now, I don't necessarily have to believe that the earth was created in seven, seven natural days to be consistent with my belief that God created the heaven and the earth because I know a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. So I don't have to necessarily argue with science over how, how old the earth is. But if it comes right down to it, I can believe that if God wanted to create it all and everything we see in seven, in one week's time, in our time, then so be it. I don't care what science says, you know. That's good. We stand on the word of God. So right. um, yes, there are some of these things, there's ways to understand it and reconcile it, and it's just a limited knowledge that we have. But uh, the same thing with uh, the doctrine of the word of, uh, the word of God. There is sound doctrine. If you, if you skip the creeds and the councils and all the stuff that happened for 1,500 years after the apostles passed off the scene and all the changes in the doctrine that happened, if you just skip all that and come back to the New Testament, okay, and you just do what the apostles did, if you just believe what they taught, then you eliminate all of that confusion. Because God hasn't changed and the message hasn't changed. We're still living in the same dispensation of grace that began on the day of Pentecost. So we can eliminate all that. But the Apostle Paul had to tell the Ephesian church this. Why? Because it's easy for us to just believe this, believe that, believe what's convenient, right? right. So he's, he's warning them to stay with the Word of God. And I've learned that it takes time to prove something. Right. It takes time. Anybody that believes in uh, the principle of tithing will tell you that whenever they first started doing that, it was something that had to be proven. Right. Sometimes you have to go through difficult times to prove that tithing works and that that God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. But you also have to understand sometimes that God doesn't equate all blessings with finance, right? Right. Sometimes we think, well, I gave money. I should expect to get a lot of money. But I thank God that he's kept me healthy. I thank God that he's kept my family together. I thank God that he's taking me through difficult times and in times whenever we we deal with situations in our family and and sometimes there's things that we can't prevent we can't correct god still is with us picks us up takes us through those situations and god proves himself to us if we will stay with him long enough i've i've had this uh situation with many people that come into the church they don't stay long enough to prove god that he will be faithful to them the first sign of trouble, they say, well, you know, they told me things are going to be better if I live for God. They will, but you got to stick with it, and you've got to prove it, and you've got to hold fast to the good things that God is doing in your life. Read for me Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Who has that? Oh, the babysitter has that, so we have to wait just a second here. I think we're going to get through this. Maria. Maria were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the churches every day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. All right. Now, I have um, always felt this way 
I don't get worried if somebody comes into the church and they don't accept the teachings of the church right away. In fact, that encourages me. Um, one of the people we baptized here on Sunday, he's in um, class downstairs tonight, Terry. Um, I've got to know Terry uh, on a personal level. And he's very, very intelligent, very, very studious. And you know what? People that are that way, they don't just take what you say at face value. They're going to go, and they're going to look up the scriptures. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. There's a, a depth in that. And a person who comes slowly and studies the word of God for themselves, once they are convinced, you will never take that away from them. But... People who sometimes may respond very quickly and easily. They're just like that, uh, that word of God that's planted in rocky soil. And it said that it came up immediately and they received the word with joy. But because there was no depth of earth, right. when the trials came, when the sun came and scorched the earth, then uh, what was planted in them very quickly died out. And so let's not ever... Um, let's don't ever have the attitude of, well, that person, they should have went to the altar by now. They, we just keep preaching. We just keep singing. We just keep worshiping. We just keep welcoming. We just keep allowing them to be a part, right? right. And in their time, they will receive the word of God if they are hungry-hearted. And if a person comes back to church over and over again, then that tells us that there's a reason that God is moving in their lives. So the farmer doesn't go out there when he plants his corn crop he didn't go out there the next day and say, well, there's no corn here. Right. And get down on his hands and knees and dig up to make sure the yes, seed's sir. still in the ground. Right? right? He didn't do that. He waits. And then first it's the blade, and then uh, there's the ear, and then there's the corn in the ear. Yes, but it's sir. a process uh, of time uh, before you have the harvest. And so we need to prove what God is doing, be faithful over time, and we will see God perform the things that he has promised. All right. Um, the last instruction, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, evil sometimes will wrap itself in pretty packaging. Yes, sir. So... There are many times that things that are bad don't look bad. But good does not wrap itself in evil packaging. Now, that's not to say that, that God does not use bad things that come into our lives for good. Joseph said, what you meant to me for evil when his brothers sold him into slavery. And in the end, when they were united, he had the opportunity to take vengeance on them. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, okay? But uh, with that said, if there's something that we are thinking of becoming involved in, okay? If it appears evil, then we should stay away from it. Good is not going to masquerade as evil. Does this make any sense? Right. Okay. So abstain from all appearance of evil. If it appears wrong, if it appears questionable, don't involve yourself with it. If there's that little check in your spirit that says this doesn't look right, then just abstain from it. And if we would apply that, it would, it would eliminate a whole lot of problems and uh, would make unnecessary a lot of things that... Uh, pastor and other ministry have to preach and teach about because if we would just apply that principle then we would stay out of condemnation we would we would stay out of places that begin to um, begin to pull us away from our relationship with God so if it appears wrong or questionable then stay away from it this is the reason why that if I go to a restaurant and I I'm eating shrimp, and the shrimp comes out, and it's a little bit translucent around the edges. And, and I take a bite, and it tastes a little off. I'm not going to eat that plate of shrimp. You know why? Because uh, we were in California on vacation several years ago, and I thought I was going to die 
after I ate a plate full of shrimp at TGI Fridays, and within two hours, well, I'm not going to give you the details, but it lasted four days, and we thought we was going to have to reschedule our flight home because I was so deathly sick, and um, all because that I ate something that was questionable. Okay, so now I go by the appearance. I mean, it doesn't mean I'm never going to get any bad shrimp, but I'm going to look at it, and if it looks bad, right. I'm going to say it's probably bad. All right? We should apply that to our walk with God. Yes, and if we do that, um, it would take care of, of most debatable issues of holy living would be taken care of just by applying that principle. A true Christian does not have to look at a list of rules and regulations to determine every action. Right. We are led of the Spirit. We are led of the Spirit. We are not under the law. That's good. But the Apostle Paul said, abstain from the appearance of evil right. and everything will be okay. All right, let's read these out loud together. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. The Apostle Paul said a lot in just those seven short statements, and if we'll apply them to our lives, then we will have a consistent uh, flowing of the Spirit of God in our lives and in our church. If we're strong, the church will be strong. If, if we're consistent, the church is going to be consistent. And this is how that we do it, and we make sure that we keep the gift of God operating in us. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand together. I appreciate so much everyone being in the house of God tonight. And our dear sister being back in service with us yes, again tonight. Amen. Thank God for her and all of you. Uh, don't forget that Sunday is Father's Day. All the men and